Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the International Society for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect. We thank you for joining us today and appreciate all you're doing to help children during this very challenging time. In recent months, children have been exposed to large amounts of information about COVID-19 and heightened levels of stress and anxiety in the adults around them. Studies have shown effective communication about life-threatening conditions is associated with better psychological outcomes, as well as improved treatment adherence and disease progression. However, such communication is emotionally challenging, not only for children and parents, but also the healthcare professionals undertaking this important task. Today, Dr. Louise Dalton and Dr. Elizabeth Rapa of the University of Oxford Department of Psychiatry will discuss their work on the importance of effective communication with children and ways to ensure the needs of children are not overlooked. Right now, I have everyone on mute to avoid background noise. We welcome you to please enter any questions or comments in the questions box throughout the presentation. The presenters will respond to questions at the end as time permits. The recording of today's webinar and the slides will also be posted on the ISPCAN website for limited time after the webinar. They will then be archived and available for members only. Dr. Louise Dalton is a consultant clinical psychologist with more than 20 years of experience at the National Health Service, and Dr. Elizabeth Rapa is a senior postdoctoral researcher. Under the leadership of Professor Alan Stein, the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Group at the University of Oxford focuses on key mechanisms of child development, including the intergenerational transmission of difficulties in the context of adversity. One of the team's main areas of research focuses on the way children are told about the diagnosis of their own or a parent's life-threatening condition. In response to the current pandemic, the team has developed a platform of resources to support healthcare workers and caregivers with the difficult task of telling relatives and children of an adult's death. Before we get started this morning, um, there are a couple of poll questions we would like to ask the audience. So I'm going to launch the first one. Can you see that, Elizabeth? And Louise? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this one is asking about your profession or discipline. I know I could not include probably everyone's, but please mark the one that is um, closest for you or other. Give you a few seconds here. Okay. Looks like everyone's about done. And let's see if I can share that. Can you see the results? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So it looks like we have about 40% social work, 24% psychology, 10% NGO, 9% medicine, and 17% other. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead with another one. Just a moment. Okay, this next one is asking about your confidence in talking to children about illness and death. So if you could please answer, very confident, somewhat confident, not confident, or it makes me very uncomfortable. Okay, looks like we're about done there. And let me share those results. Okay, so most people are somewhat confident, 62%, not confident, 19%, very confident, 14 and 5%, it makes me very uncomfortable. Okay, thank you so much everyone for participating in that poll. Helps give the presenters a bit of an idea. Um, so we would like to thank Louise and Elizabeth for being with us today. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth, who's our first speaker. One moment, please. And Elizabeth, it's your screen, correct? Yes, please. Okay, one moment. Okay. 
Okay, are you getting a message to share your screen yet? No. Okay, one moment. I'm trying to close the poll. Is the poll visible? Yes, I think I have a message saying hide poll results to enable screen sharing on my machine. Okay, sorry about that. Hi, Elizabeth, we can see you now. Hello, you can see me, great. Um, it's not, oh, here we go. Brilliant, now you can see my children. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so, um, hi, I'm Elizabeth Brapa. Um, I just thought I'd put my camera on just to start with so you can see what I look like. Um, I'll turn it off now. Um, so thank you so much for allowing us to talk today. Um, thank you for the wonderful introduction as well. I think um, you've covered most of what we're going to say today, um, which essentially is going to be talking about how you communicate with children about life-threatening conditions, and um, later on in the talk, more specifically about during um, COVID-19 pandemic. So that's just our overview. As um, Heather very kindly said, we're from um, the psychiatry team based at the University of Oxford. So we're just going to talk a bit about the background, about um, effective communication, the evidence that um, we've looked at, and the framework that we produced um, back in 2019. And then, as I said, the latter part of the talk would be much more specifically about COVID and the resources that we've produced. So I suppose if we first kind of think about how communication with children has changed over about the last 70 years. So I'm sure very much of you are all aware that during the 1960s, it was kind of really universally thought that children shouldn't, shouldn't really be told anything about their prognosis or their diagnosis, primarily just to shield them from any distress. But then over the subsequent decades, there was just an increasing recognition that actually telling children or a word that we'll use quite a lot today is disclosure. So actually telling children about an illness or a, um, or a death um, has increased. And we understand the importance that children do need to know. And that's probably sort of in part due to advances in care and treatment, because obviously survival rates are increasing. But it's also an appreciation that we understand a lot more about children's evolving developmental understanding. What we also tend to do now as well is acknowledge that an illness or a death affects the whole family. And we're much more adopting a family-centered model that's used as much more frequently in pediatric care. And I think we can also um, realize that the role of the doctor has changed and that, that the relationship between doctors and patients has definitely changed over time, where it's now much more common to have a more shared decision-making process. And, and that is to allow um, the patient um, to advocate for their own care. So why is it so important? So we know that children have to understand what's going on around them and what's happening, not only to themselves, but people in their family or their close um, extended family. We know that it improves cooperation with procedures, um, adherence to treatment, and can actually affect how an illness progresses. And like I said previously, it just allows the families and the children to be empowered and advocate for their own care. So if we think about parental illness, children notice everything that's going on around them. Louise and I, and we hope by the end of this talk, will realise how passionate we are about advocating for all children, especially really young children. Little children notice everything that's going on around them, whether that be appearances or behaviours. So, for instance, if a parent is ill, that perhaps they're at clinic appointments, they're taking medication, or if they're very ill, that their appearance is changing or their behaviours because they're anxious or upset or generally feeling unwell. And if we don't provide anything like that for children, they try and make sense of what they're seeing completely on their own and in, in isolation, probably too scared to ask what's going on in case they upset somebody. And so they kind of construct their own reality. And what's very clear to a lot of the research is that actually that's often much more dire than the truth to do a direct quote. And so those children are left sometimes feeling guilty because maybe they think they've done something to change this situation in their family that they're being provided no explanation for and they feel scared and very much on their own and so we know that this definitely has an impact psychologically and physically not only on the well-being of the children but of the parents and the caregivers and family as a whole so this 
we think this is um, very eloquently encapsulated by a um, colleague of ours whose um, father unfortunately died of cancer and this is what she writes about frequently of what happened to her when she was a child. So for seven years I slept on the landing outside my parents bedroom. I knew something was terribly terribly wrong but no one ever told me that the reason I was feeling this way and so scared was that my father had cancer. So as you can see, it just shows that if you're not provided with an explanation, the ch children will react and feel in a, in a way that, that um, is not nice for them or um, for their family. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so this is, uh, I'm just gonna put my screen on quickly so you can see me. So um, my, I'm Louise and I'm going to be doing the next few slides. Um, Elizabeth and I will take it in turn, so hopefully you don't get too bored of either one of us speaking. So when we're talking about communication, it's important to acknowledge that there are several well-established models for breaking bad news, but these are very much adult focused and they don't take into account that children's understanding of what illness is and what death means changes with age. And for chronic illness, of course, these conversations are not one-off events, but they need to be repeated, repeated and kind of elaborated upon as children's understanding develops over time so that communication and information that they're given reflects this. So we're just going to have a very brief recap of some of the developmental context for children's understanding of death. So we talk about a mature understanding of death involving acquisition of a number of particular concepts. So first of all, um, that once something's died, it can't be made alive again, that all living things die, and that also includes ourselves, and an understanding of what happens physically after death, and also what might realistically cause something to die. So although very young children don't understand illness or death itself, even infants are very attuned to subtle changes in the responsiveness of their caregivers. And under twos will notice the absence of familiar people um, when they're no longer visiting on a regular basis or when they leave for a long period of time, perhaps after a death. Three to four year olds understand that living things die, but not that death is irreversible. So what's really important is for children of this age that we have to repeat that the dead person cannot and will not return. I particularly wanted to draw your attention to magical thinking, which is common in children between the ages of about four and seven years old. In this audio clip, Maya Angelou powerfully describes her own magical thinking after a serious sexual assault in childhood. The clip is exactly one minute, so if anyone would prefer to mute for its duration um, and then rejoin us afterwards, um, we'll see you in a minute on the other side. When I was seven and a half, I was raped by uh, my mother's boyfriend. And the uh, rapist was killed. The policeman told my grandmother, my mother's mother, with whom I was staying, that um, the man had been kicked to death, they thought. And I heard that. And somehow with my seven and a half year old logic, I decided that my voice had killed him. That um, because I told who did it, that my voice was the culprit. And so I decided that um, I better not talk because anybody whose name I called or who heard me might die. Thank you. So magical thinking means that we need to be really, really careful about the language that we use and we need to be very concrete to avoid confusion. So in the UK, we find that we often use euphemisms to talk about death perhaps in an attempt, I suppose, for ourselves to, to soften the harsh reality of what's happened. But actually, these can really create misunderstandings for children. So if we talk and say, oh, you know, we've lost granddad, granddad has been lost, maybe a child could think, well, if only if we search hard enough and really try, perhaps we can find him again. So if we think now about adolescents, adolescents, of course, have a very sophisticated understanding of death. But changes to the brain during adolescence mean that they have a much greater focus on short-term consequences 
which can very much affect treatment decisions, for example. So I can't possibly start treatment now because I absolutely have to go to the party. Um, and some of the normal kind of, I guess, what we'd call tasks of adolescents to separate from their family, to achieve independence and autonomy can be significantly disrupted by serious illness. Um, and so some of these challenges have been recognised in the development of specific services for the adolescent age group. Um, and in the UK, they're known as teenage young adult services, um, particularly um, they have been very popular for young people um, who have cancer. So what did um, so then what happened um, next on our kind of journey with this um, research area? So in 2019, um, our group was invited by The Lancet to write a series on gathering all of the evidence about how children are communicated with and to. So our group is led by Professor Alan Stein and he has on and off over the last 30 years done a lot of research in the area from his very first work um, quite a long time ago about talking to mothers about their breast cancer diagnosis and how they told or didn't tell their children about this. And then a bit more recently, we've done an intervention, a series of intervention studies about supporting HIV positive mothers in South Africa in how to disclose their HIV status to their children. So what it is, what is clear to us is that there is, and, and has been, um, especially from 2019, a real lack of specific guidelines and specific training about the diagnosis of a life-threatening condition. So we know that this is going on all over the world millions of times a day and that actual moment when someone is given a diagnosis and how it's given is remembered vividly forever. So we were asked to um, collate all of the research that has um, been undertaken and also part of this process we had a workshop that was composed of a, a huge group of international experts based in both low and middle income and high income countries and from a real range of um, disciplines, experience and job roles. So what we're just going to do, and obviously we're not going to go through the, the papers in, um, in lots of detail, but just highlight the main things that we found. So we did one paper focused on when children are diagnosed with their own life-threatening condition, and one when parents have been diagnosed. So what was the overall findings of the review? So one of the main things is that the research is definitely and very much so disproportionately focused on cancer in high income countries and HIV in low and middle income countries. We found that it was rarely the primary research question, but there would, sometimes, there would often be a communication element um, included. We found that the disclosure, like I said, or telling of, um, to children hugely varied. And although people acknowledge that it was a really important thing to do, highlighted in this study here, that actually, um, although 79% of people said we should definitely do it, actually in reality, less people do it. So in this study, only 20, um, nearly 20% did. And this is the same um, in parental, similarly in um, parental illnesses, children were often not actually officially told about their parents' diagnosis. But even so, as we've said before, they were completely aware of their parents' diagnosis, highlighted very um, acutely here in this study. But what we did find is all of the studies that were exploring the children's views about communication consistently reported that children wanted honest information about the diagnosis, the prognosis and the illness. So if we just have a little think about um, and go through the paper that was focused on the children's own life-threatening condition, we know that it's very common, there's a few stats here, um, and although that the existing literature, which I'm going to um, summarise for you now, is primarily focused on cancer and HIV, in fact, these conversations, as I've said, are relevant to a wide ranging specialities and disciplines. Um, and what's really important, because obviously it's something our group do a lot of work in low and middle income countries, that is in fact that the survival rates are much poorer compared to high income countries. Um, and as you can see, um, a few stats for comparison there. 
So what did these studies show in terms of outcomes for the children? So generally, benefits were seen in relation to emotional, behavioural and social outcomes. And by telling the children about their illness, we found that um, there were reports of lower psychological problems, so anxiety and depression here, um, and that actually not telling the children led to more difficulties emotionally and behaviourally. And then we also found that communication can help children understand more about what's going on and what's happening to them. So therefore you can imagine if a child is told about their illness that they're going to probably engage better with um, treatment and procedures and then they're actually the trust um, between their, themselves and their parents and the healthcare professionals actually increases. Having an awareness of of your own illness um, also impacts on children's behaviours and this is especially um, evident here with um, children that are HIV positive because actually telling them that they're HIV positive changes their understanding of their diagnosis and as you can see here actually results in changes in their sexual behaviour for the better. It can even have an effect um, communication that is on the progression of a disease. Again, HIV here, that children who didn't know that they had HIV actually had lower CD4, CD4 counts, which is an indicator of their HIV progression or their disease status at that time, um, compared to those that actually did know they were HIV positive who had improved CD4 counts. We know that there's also a relationship between effective communication and outcomes for parents and caregivers and the whole family. We know that if um, actually telling the child of their illness, they, the children themselves feel more supported by their caregivers and the um, health team around them. And actually it was reported that parents felt relieved that they finally weren't keeping a secret from their children. As you can see here in this bereaved um, Swedish study, 33% of um, parents did tell their children that they were going to die and none of those regretted, regretted telling their children this. And actually of the ones that didn't tell their children, um, almost 30% did regret not talking about it and actually reported increased rates of anxiety and depression. This is also an important um, effective communication is important for that healthcare professional and parent relationship and actually it was found that the communication style improved the trust between the caregivers and the team and actually that did increase um, the adherence to treatment and um, procedures. So if we um, think about communication now I guess it isn't linear when a child's unwell, we can think of three key stakeholders. We've got the child, the parents or caregivers, and the healthcare professional in a dynamic triad. And of course, when there are multiple medical teams involved or parents are separated, then this becomes ever more complex. So if we start with what affects children's communication, and then we'll come to each of those stakeholders in turn. Um, although many children do want to know about their illness, this isn't universal. A study of childhood cancer survivors found that some had very much embraced their cancer and become kind of experts in cancer and advocates for people with cancer, whereas others felt very much in hindsight that their limited understanding of their illness and what was happening had helped them to cope. But children's communication might be inhibited by their insight into just how distressing and upsetting talking about their illness is for their parent or they may not share their fears um, so that the healthcare team view them as brave and courageous. But ineffective con communication can also arise when parents don't have an accurate perception of their child's understanding. And for me, this really is an absolutely key point, linking back to some of the developmental theory that we just kind of, um, sort of whizzed over and recapped earlier on. So an Italian study found that parents tended to underestimate how much younger children understood and so didn't give them enough information about what was happening, whereas they overestimated how much their older children understood and so gave them too much or too complex information. So if we think now about parents and their role in the triad, 
parental communication is very much linked to parents' own understanding and their own emotional response to the diagnosis. So a study um, showed that parents who were very shocked and were really struggling to grasp the information about their child's illness were much more likely to tell their child as much as they understood, including that the diagnosis was cancer. Whereas parents who thought that the diagnosis was incurable and would result in their child dying gave their child as little information as possible. So we really need to be aware of how parents are a conduit to their, their child. Understandably, parents are concerned that talking to their child will lead to questions that they just can't answer. And being asked by their child, am I going to die, is one that's particularly feared by parents who may then evolve, avoid the whole topic. And the ongoing stigma around HIV is also important to highlight in terms of inhibiting these conversations. Particularly, parents describe fearing questions from their child about the source of their HIV diagnosis or that the child will disclose their status to other people outside of the family. And finally, of course, every parent wants to protect their child from distress. And many parents describe fears that talking to their child will create kind of uncontainable distress that they just can't manage or will have a negative impact on their child's psychological well-being or perhaps cause their child to, to lose hope and give up. And then if we just then turn to the healthcare professional, their contribution to this triad is also influenced by their own professional and personal beliefs. But in addition, healthcare professionals describe barriers in terms of their own perception of their own skills or having enough time for these conversations or sometimes a concern about how they might challenge a family who appear to be coping by not thinking or not even talking about the possibility of death. And actually, is it their role to disrupt that or to challenge the family about it? Clinical uncertainty about the prognosis or indeed the diagnosis can also affect um, healthcare professionals' willingness to communicate with families. And of course, it goes without saying that these painful situations can trigger our own memories of loss and grief. Interestingly, one study suggests that as healthcare professionals, we can seek to manage these feelings that we have by creating distance between ourselves and our patients, perhaps through generating a sense of busyness or a formality, which impedes that com communication. And just to kind of bring us back, I guess, to thinking about those three aspects of the triad, not everybody in this triad is going to have the same view of what and how information should be shared. And of course, that can lead to conflict. And as I just touched upon a moment ago, we also can't ignore that power dynamic between children and their parents who may well be the gatekeepers of information. Most importantly, we also need to be alert for situations in which both the child and parent are trying to protect one another by pretending things are OK. Um, and this situation of mutual pretense leaves children having to face difficult information and challenging situations alone. So then if we just think about our parental illness paper, again, very similar to the child paper, we know that this is a high global prevalence. But the difference, slight difference with this paper is, so not only the parents themselves being diagnosed with a life-threatening condition, they are then also not coping with their diagnosis and their illness whilst also being a parent. And again, in low and middle income countries, this is a much more common situation. And in fact, in parts of Southern Africa where we work, over a quarter of pregnant women are actually HIV positive. So very briefly, going through the findings of the review, similar to the child paper, we know that effective communication has an effect on children's psychological and behavioral outcomes, with disclosure being associated again with lower psychological problems, and then poor communication or no communication about their par the parental illness actually leads to increases in problems. These results are varied and studies have and but studies do show that there are differences in when the children are told and how much information they are told. So um, there have been some intervention studies um, that have been conducted clearly showing the benefits of effective communication. Um, although some of these studies do only include a component that addresses communication. So those studies do make it a little bit harder for us to try and actually identify what that specific thing is that is responsible for some of the changes we're seeing. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, our, te our team um, with our collaborator collaborators in South Africa, um, which is led by Tamsin Rocha, um, conducted um, 
a study called the Amagugu study. And this was where we were specifically helping HIV positive, HIV positive mothers tell their children their HIV status. And what we found in this, and it's one of the, it's probably, actually it is the largest RCT to date for specific, specifically looking at communication, that we found improvements in how the mothers engaged with the healthcare systems, that there are improvements in the relationship between the mother and child, and actually overall that the mental health of mothers and children did improve. So hopefully from that very brief summary of our papers, you can clearly see that there are benefits of effective communication. So using this information and the workshop that I mentioned at the beginning, we thought it was appropriate to develop a framework to help healthcare professionals in undertaking these really difficult diagnostic conversations. So we did a framework for um, associated with child illness and again with parental illness, and we found that we wanted to make it very practical with giving suggested phrases and common questions that may come up we are completely aware that this was a framework that would not suit absolutely every discipline and in every situation. But we felt that it was um, giving the main points and the main um, steps that you need to take. So actually with that in mind, we also um, gained some funding to do some workshops in South Africa and Uganda, where we actually um, changed, we adapted our framework to take into consideration cultural and religious differences. Um, but of course, earlier this year, with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, everyone is now talking about life-threatening illness. Our lives have all changed dramatically and we need to talk to all our children about what's happening around them, not just those who've been directly affected by a loved one's illness or death. So in this last part of our talk, we're going to talk both about this general and also then specific communication. Children have often felt very invisible in the past few months, so we thought we'd hear a child's view of the current situation and her words are voiced by an actress. I know that coronavirus means that I can't go to school and I can't play with my friends. I know it means I can't see my grandma and everyone has to wash their hands all the time. I know it makes people really sick and lots of people have died. But I don't understand why my brother is so grumpy, even though he normally hates school, and why my mum and dad are arguing, even though they think I can't hear them. So it's clear from this that children know a lot about the practical implications of COVID. They're familiar with the importance of social distancing and hand washing, but what's less clear for her is the wider emotional ramifications and how this is affecting her family. Our conversations are absolutely dominated by the pandemic and our media is saturated with news of hospitalizations, death tolls, restrictions, and socially pretty much every conversation I have certainly starts with how people are coping. There's an awful lot of very good quality information, animations and books for children about the virus and about hand washing and about social distancing. But crucially, children are very, very aware of adults' reactions to world events, our own fear of the pandemic and the longer term ramifications for our society. And at the same time, the familiarity of children's routines and activities have been completely disrupted. And this social infrastructure is critical to children's well-being. In our past lives, when children were facing individual psychological challenges, these structures, particularly school, provided a refuge of familiarity for children. And so in that way are critical to children's mental health and resilience. So drawing on the evidence from developmental theory and psychological research, we've pulled together some key messages. I guess the first one very much echoes what we've been talking about already, that really we need to listen to children and ask what they understand about what's happening so that we can pitch information to them at the right developmental level, not too basic, not too much. And particularly for younger children, that information needs to be very specific and very concrete to avoid misunderstandings. But I think one of our key messages is that we also need to be authentic about how we as adults are feeling. It's important for us to share that actually we're feeling anxious or unsettled or frustrated so that children don't misinterpret or misattribute changes in our behaviour to something else, perhaps blaming themselves um, for not being good enough. And 
by talking about our own feelings, we can give children a model of how we do this and how to do this themselves. And it can be helpful to remind them that lots of other children are also experiencing similar emotions. They're also missing school, missing their friends, feeling fed up, um, so that they feel less alone in a situation. Of course, we know that children's behaviour is likely to change in response to these emotionally challenging times. And simply recognising this and, and labelling this can, can also be really, really helpful. Despite the challenges, we can also help children focus on things that they can still do. Um, we can talk about the bits of our lives that still kind of bear some resemblance to how life looked in 2019. And we can also use it as an opportunity to talk with children about our own feelings of anxiety and frustration, for example, and how we might cope. Actually, I'm feeling really fed up today. I think I'm going to go for a long walk or I'm going to um, go for a run. So again, modelling those coping behaviours that are so important to teach children about emotional regulation. And really, it's about opening up these lines of communication with children so that they're not facing this alone and that any misunderstandings or worries that they can have, they can talk about and share with us together. Um, so we summarise these points in a comment that was published in the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health um, earlier this year. And also in collaboration uh, with our colleagues at Blackpool Better Start, um, we put together a short video um, which is about talking to children under five um, about the um, coronavirus um, with some very practical ideas um, with, for parents and families um, about how they could open up these critically important conversations. So now, um, excuse me, so now if we think about actually children and families that have been affected by the illness and death of a loved one during the pandemic due to COVID or not due to COVID, so what happened originally is um, our local hospital in Oxford contacted us to help them with this um, issue uh, based on the framework and the Lancet review that we'd written. And what we needed to really think about and understand is how much things have changed in the hospitals. So we now know that when you are, and this is changing all the time, and I know it will be very different in every country, and even um, if you're in the UK, in every town, on who is allowed to go to the hospital, if you're allowed at all. So mostly I think patients are alone in hospital and they don't see, have any visitors. So this makes it so incredibly difficult for healthcare professionals because they either have none or very few opportunities to develop what they normally would do, a relationship with relatives. And also some professionals may not see that actually children are part of their role as well as if they're predominantly adult clinicians involved in this pandemic. So all of this to us and something that we were so worried about just absolutely increases the invisibility of children during the pandemic and if you think about it now the, the way families are structured is that you have no idea with the person the patient in front of you what important relationships do they have they may not be a parent they may not be a grandparent but actually children have such important relationships with so many people and that's what we were really really concerned about again it compounded by the fact that most of this sensitive news now of death or near death or the illness is frequently conveyed by telephone again i know things are changing but predominantly this is still the case and so you have the healthcare professional calling the family to share this devastating news and then the families are then left on their own without the support of the healthcare healthcare professional, which would normally have occurred before um, COVID, to then have to share this news with the children in the home. And coupled with the lack of the time between taking the phone call and then going to see the children, whether they be downstairs or coming back from um, playing outside, and that lack of privacy, because now we are all together a lot more than we normally were in the family household. So what did we do with this, all of the, this situation and with our expertise that we've had over the last um, few years? So what we wanted to do is we produced, based on our framework, a step-by-step -step detailed infographic guide on helping healthcare professionals 
with this difficult, um, conveying this difficult and devastating news. We also thought it was very important that we coupled this with an animation so people could watch it on their iPhone before um, they had to make these phone calls. We also extended this to, um, as the pandemic unfolded, to help care home staff and care home staff, meaning people that look after our more aging population in residential homes, because they are obviously having to make these, converse, uh, these telephone calls more frequently than we ever thought they would. And what we also wanted to do was not just help the staff but also support those families with what i just mentioned being left having the news and then having to tell any children so we've developed a guide and animation to support that as louise mentioned those um support structures school being probably the most important were also absent although some children have gone back to school and we really do hope in this country that children will be able to go back to school in september so we also wanted to support staff in those conversations because often children may not feel they can ask some of the more difficult conversations with their parents in fear of upsetting them so we were helping we produced a guide to help staff um prepare for those perhaps more challenging or difficult questions and how you could answer them. So what was absolutely critical in our staff um, guide is, and what kind of puts it apart from other wonderful guides that are out there to help um, support these conversations, is the absolute critical step of identifying if the patient had any reported relationships with children. So that's actually one of our points in the guide. And then you then ask the family if they can, the healthcare or the staff can then um, send them our family guide and animation to help them then share this news with any children. And we've been, we're very lucky we have good collaborations with organisations such as yourself and others that have helped to disseminate these and we have translated them into multiple languages um, and we are happy to translate them into more if um, people um, feel there is the need. So just um, thinking about other situations that have occurred because of COVID, we also were approached by our paediatric oncology team in the hospital, who um, a very experienced consultant saying, I now have to make some of these, um, my normal conversations about diagnosis or test results um, person to person, I now have, in person, sorry, I now have to do that over the telephone. And I'm really not quite sure how to do that. Um, in the most effective way. And as you can imagine, this not only relates to paediatric oncology, but actually many different disciplines, because lots of these um, consultations are now having, having to happen over the telephone. So again, we created a step-by-step -step guide for the professionals and the families in how to communicate those, this life-changing news, whether it be bad test results, that actually your treatment options have changed dramatically, and um, if very sadly, that the only option now is palliative and end-of-life care. And again, these conversations would normally be supported by the team, and this just hasn't been able to happen in so many areas. So just looking at the time, um, I think I will just pay a couple of minutes of our animation, just so you can get a feel of what we've been talking about to summarize some of the points as well so i probably won't be able to play it in full but i will play a few minutes this is a guide for healthcare professionals to take you step by step through the process of telling relatives by telephone about the death of a patient from covid19 there are seven steps and advice if the patient has children in their family this video is supported by two written guides one for you as a healthcare professional and one for the relative to help them tell any children in the family. First, prepare yourself. Take a few slow, deep breaths to help you focus. Check the patient's information. What's their name? Do you know if they had children or a partner? If you can, relatives have found it helpful to know the name of who was with their loved one towards the end of their life. Check the latest protocol for when a patient has died and what bereavement support is available. You could practice what you're going to say with a colleague. Find a space where you won't be interrupted. Pass your bleep or phone to a colleague, and if possible, use a landline. Step two, starting the phone call. If the person does not answer the phone, do not leave a voicemail. 
If they do answer, introduce yourself by name. Clearly explain which team and hospital you're calling from and establish who you're speaking to. Check that they can talk privately. Speak slowly. Counting to three in your head can help slow you down, particularly if you're feeling nervous. If the person is very distressed, they may ask straight away if their relative has died, but don't rush into it. Just continue to the next step, the warning shots, which prepare the person for the news. Set the context for the call. I'm calling to talk about John. What have you been told so far about his condition? Is there anyone else you want to be in on the call? Step four, giving the information. Talk slowly and honestly. Avoid euphemisms like passed away and don't use any technical or medical jargon. You might say something like, I'm sorry to tell you that John became very unwell and died earlier today. I'm so sorry to give you this news over the phone. After you've told the person that the patient has died, stop for a few seconds to allow the person to take in what you've said. Listen for reactions to gauge when they're ready for more information. Remember that pauses are important as you can't see the other person's reaction to what you're saying. Step five is about managing the emotional impact of the news. Do what you can to support the person. People's reaction will vary. They may cry, shout or go quiet. Just stay calmly on the line and don't feel you have to fill the silences. You might say something like, I understand this is very difficult for you to take in. Remember that distress may limit their capacity to absorb information. It is difficult to know how a person is reacting when you can't see them. It is possible they're trying to minimize their reaction because other people are in earshot. Use sounds and words like, uh-huh, mm, take your time, I'm still here. This re Thank you, Elizabeth. So just to finish off, if I can just ask you for a moment to imagine that you've just received a telephone call to say that your mother has died from coronavirus. Your two children are downstairs, well aware that you've just answered your phone behind closed doors. And in the immediacy of your own shock and distress, you now need to walk downstairs and tell the children this life changing news. We made our resources with this moment in mind, with the aim of making these seemingly impossible conversations possible. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, we would, of course, be delighted to take your questions. Our contact details are here, as well as a link to the resources that we've talked about. Um, these are absolutely free for you to download and to disseminate. Um, we would also love to have your feedback about what we've done, and we've got a short online questionnaire, so do please complete that if you can. Um, we're really keen to incorporate your feedback and improve the guides as we move forward. Um, and sadly, it seems that this difficult situation that we find ourselves in is going to be lasting um, quite some time. So again, we're very keen to kind of keep having new iterations of the, of the guides and to improve them based on um, people's feedback and thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Louise, for sharing this really interesting and important information today. Um, I'm going to take the screen back. One moment, please. That's my teacher. <laughs> OK, and just a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions or comments for the presenters, please type them in the questions box, and we will get to as many as we can. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. I'll, I'll start with ones just related to COVID. Um, and this may be just for certain cultural contexts and countries, but um, this attendee is asking how to help children, uh, maybe at all ages, understand conflicting messages on the severity of COVID, including among peers. I know this is an issue in the United States. I don't if is that relating to a particular age group or is that I, I um actually this person was asking for uh, about teenagers but I think you know probably it would affect all ages right I think that's a, a really interesting point and actually not not something that I've come across um personally in in the UK yeah. I guess it perhaps speaks to a um kind of broader piece about thinking with young people about um, how they digest news and about identifying sources of kind of um, accurate information and also how misinformation can be spread very, very easily on the internet. Um, so I think probably it's it's a wider piece. And I think, again, perhaps as a, 
from a parental perspective rather than from a professional perspective, but one could do it in the same as, as a professional, would also be kind of looking at the information together and thinking about, I guess, a, how do we test kind of what, how do we benchmark? Is this good quality information? Um, or actually, how do I know what I can trust and, and how what I what I can't trust? Yeah, it's very much like we mentioned at the beginning um, of the COVID section of our talk. It's just about opening up that line of communication with your children. So even if um, they may be specific, not specifically asking to just check in with them and see what they understand and believe, because all of the things that we've ever looked at and the studies show that actually sitting down with children and finding out what they understand and the facts they have often aren't right or they're not quite right and again like we said it's about doing that together and I know that's not always very easy but in fact in a time like this when we are spending more time together in lockdown or even if lockdown is being eased you can open up those lines of communication and that's what's really important. Okay thank you for that. Um, here's a question about communicating these messages to children with mental disabilities. Can you speak to that? So, yes, absolutely. So um, I have to say that, um, again, another piece, the, um, a lot of the work that's been done around children's developmental understanding is very much based on um, children in high income countries rather than um, kind of conducted globally. So I think that's um, something important that we need to address in that research. Um, I guess it would be thinking about that developmental model and holding that in mind. And for a child with intellectual disabilities, I think, as I would probably suggest for all children, really starting with what they know and understand and by asking them um, and trying to explore that with them would be a very sensible place to start in terms of gauging children's level of understanding. And then also potentially using um, kind of visual materials and things like that as well to um, try and um, support children who perhaps may have a specific um, language impairment or their understanding may be better with kind of concrete information. Um, so I think it would be about probably some idiosyncratic communication um, and not, not I guess, not hurrying or not rushing to feel that we need to give children information before we really understand what they, un before we understand what they understand. Right. And okay. there have been some nice resources actually um, in the UK, um, just because we happen to collaborate with um, a, um, a SCN, so a special educational needs, some special educational needs teachers. And there are some things, but again, they are probably a bit more focused on the practical aspects of Corona. But um, uh, I'm, I don't know of any specific that are more about the emotional side of it. It's not our expertise, unfortunately. We did have um, some, um, one of the doctors on our Lancet papers does deal with this subject um, and I'd be very happy to pass on her um, information. It isn't specifically about COVID though, but she has written a lot of guidelines on how you do facilitate these conversations. Okay, thank you. Um, and you may have touched on this, but we have a question here about, and this could be related to COVID or, or any illness or life-threatening condition, how to help children um, reconcile their feelings of helplessness. And along with that, you know, fear and anxiety, maybe signs of, of normal fear, anxiety, and helplessness and, and signs that it's not normal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Again, a, a really good question. Um, I think that um, labelling for children, um, kind of the, the different feelings that they're experiencing, is often a very good place to start. Um, feelings are quite complex beasts, I always think, and um, it's very rare that we, we feel a single feeling in isolation. Um, we might be feeling um, both anxious and frustrated and worried and fed up. And often I think with young people, it's about sort of disentangling what all those different feelings are and then also linking those to particular thoughts um, that children may be having as well so actually okay there's there's some of part of the frustration is about not being able to do the things that i want to do part of the anxiety is related to fear that somebody i love will get sick and so on so i think that that can can be really helpful to start off with and then i think the next step will be thinking about um, just kind of normalizing normalizing that and um, the children in terms of actually lots of people are, are feeling these feelings and also you know as I mentioned earlier it's about being authentic about the fact that actually as adults I'm feeling quite anxious 
quite a lot of the time I'm also feeling pretty fed up, pretty fed up with the things that I can't do um, or the way that my life's changed. So again, just modeling for children that actually that those are very normal, um, understandable feelings in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. There's been quite a lot of um, research that um, certainly young people's sleep routines have been very, very disrupted. Um, and so again, I suppose when we're looking for signs of perhaps more um, significant psychological distress, I would start be thinking about kind of sleeping, eating, interest and engagement in kind of hobbies. Is this somebody, is this a child who now doesn't want to do the things that they would ordinarily do, which are possible given the current restrictions? So I think I would be starting to use that as, a, as an indicator of actually is this within the normal that, we are, that we're all living in at the moment, which is very abnormal, or is this going above and beyond? Um, but as I say, bearing in mind that we know it seems that children's sleep has been particularly affected um, during the pandemic. And I, I think it answers that question. Yeah, um, I think so. <laughs> and I also <laughs> think it's about, um, so we touch on it in our Blackpool video, which was specifically for um, talking to children under five, just about COVID, not about um, illness and death. Um, about actually recognising that maybe some of the behaviours that this person has asked the question about um, is probably as a consequence of COVID and to maybe just step back for two seconds and think, or oh, maybe the baby is being more clingy or is having a tentative temper tantrum and just helping you parents, I mean, it's much more easier said than done, but maybe just having that little bit of acknowledgement that maybe the reason why these behaviours are being shown is as a consequence of COVID. So not quite answering the question, but I think it's really important. And actually, we've spoken to parents um, and that was really helpful for them to go, oh, yeah, I just, you know, just to have that acknowledgement that parenting is really difficult in the moment. We're all struggling and that is OK. So I think that's a very important point to remember. Okay, thank you. Um, and this question, kind of a two-part question related to children speaking with their peers. Um, do you, would you say that, or would you recommend encouraging children to talk to friends about illness, death, or, or COVID? And if so, um, how can, well, how can any parent, teacher, or other professional uh, manage the impact of these conversations between children whose understanding is, is probably influenced by lots of things? Um, well, I think Louise would probably be able to give more of a clinical um, answer, but just thinking about what we found in the research is that when it came to children's preferences of how to talk about their illness and their diagnosis was very much that peer support was incredibly helpful and incredibly important because obviously the you know only a peer can understand what they're going through and um, because they're in the same situation but again that had to be managed in the way that it was a good um support network it was um potentially facilitated although that's probably a bit strong but that it that though those support groups were recommended by the healthcare team and i know that before covid the get togethers and the um sort of community engagement um events were very important to especially adolescents to meet other adolescents that were also going through um the process and being able to talk honestly about the fear of dying or their parents dying or even um those that had died so i think they absolutely play a crucial role but i completely appreciate it is quite it is quite hard to um monitor um so it doesn't become a problem um between some um groups louise i don't know if you want to add anything about clinic i would i know i would absolutely agree with what you've you've said i think that um particularly teens can find it very very helpful to talk to their peers and again it it can be quite a normalizing experience to realize that actually lots of other people are struggling with exactly the same thing that that they're struggling with um in terms of misinformation, again, I think it comes back to that importance of where possible, um, just talking about um, what young people understand, um, what their friends understand. And again, I guess, sense checking, talking about um, kind of reliable sources of, of information. Um, and again, encouraging young people to come to us with questions and not to be afraid to say that we don't know. Um, or, you know, there are so many 
unknowns in the current situation um, that also it's okay we don't have to be the experts because actually you know even the, the world's top scientists are also you know finding out more about this, this um, virus and, and how it's spread and, and so on kind of every day so we don't have to be we don't have to be the experts we don't need to be we don't need to be afraid of saying I don't know in that situation. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Elizabeth and Louise, for sharing this very um, difficult but important information with us today. And just to clarify, the resources that you've talked about are available on your website, is that correct? That's correct. They're all available there and, and free to download and to share. Okay, and we will make sure that the audience um, gets those links. Great. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, and if you have a question that didn't get answered or you think of a question you'd like to get answered, please contact us at ISPCAN um, at, at resources at ISPCAN.org, and we'll try to get those questions answered as best as we can. Thank you. Okay, and just to conclude, we would like to uh, encourage everyone to become a member of ISPCAN if you're not already, so that we can continue having webinars like these. Our member benefits include a subscription to our monthly journal, access to our past webinars and other educational resources, the ISPCAN child abuse screening tools, and discounts to our congresses, which will resume in 2021. We offer several membership levels, including our new associate membership, which is $35 a year. We invite you to visit our COVID-19 resources page for a variety of resources for professionals, parents, and children. You will also find information on upcoming webinars, including our next one next uh, on August 12th with Dr. Dick Krugman and Dr. Donald Bross on a health and public health approach to ending child abuse and neglect. To learn more about ISPCAN, please visit us at ISPCAN.org. And a reminder that a recording of today's webinar and the slides will be posted on our website shortly. If you have any questions or comments about this today's webinar or upcoming webinars, again, please contact us at resources.org. Thank you all again for joining us today and to our presenters, Elizabeth and Louise. Um, stay safe and healthy and have a great day or night, depending on where you are. Thank you, everyone. All right, bye. Bye, thank you.